The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the Gospel according to St. John in the third chapter and the 17th verse. The 17th verse in the third chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, here our Lord is obviously continuing this great statement which he makes to this Pharisee Nicodemus concerning who he was and why he had come into this world and especially in order to convey to Nicodemus a new conception of God and especially of God's love. The word for clearly indicates that. The first word in the verse is for, connecting it up with what has just gone before. So I say it is still a part of this great statement and it is very important that we should remember that. Now this is one of those verses which I think we'll all have to agree we tend to forget and to neglect. I've been saying on the last two Sunday evenings that John 3.16 is probably the best known verse in the Bible. Everybody knows John 3.16, whatever else they may not know. But I wonder how many of us in this congregation, without going any further, could have said what John 3.17 was. Well, I leave you to answer. This is one of those verses that seems to have suffered because of its proximity to another verse. Now, that's a principle which often happens in life, isn't it? There are many things which uh, are neglected simply because they're near something else. If they'd stood alone, well, we'd have paid great attention to them. But because they happen to be near something which is of surpassing excellence in that respect, whatever it may happen to be, it passes more or less unnoticed. This is true, as I say, in almost every realm. There are uh, certain great mountains in the great Himalayan range which we've never heard of. And we've never heard of them, not because they're not very high mountains, because they are very high mountains. We haven't heard of them simply because they're a little bit shorter or not as high as Mount Everest. Because Mount Everest is outstanding and the highest of all, we've never heard of these other peaks. But if you suddenly took one of those peaks and landed them, for instance, in this country, we'd never stop talking about this amazing high mountain and everybody would know the name of the mountain. Great in itself, but neglected and not noticed because of its proximity uh, to something that is yet bigger and greater in that respect. And I could go on in illustrating this almost endlessly. It's happened to many a men. There's been many a great statesman whose name has not gone down into history simply because he happened to have as a colleague a still greater one. He was unfortunate enough happened to be happening to be in this world and in that government at the time that this other man was there. And simply because of the other he has never received the attention that he should have received. Now, this verse that we're looking at tonight, it seems to me, falls into that kind of category. And, of course, it's very regrettable that this should have happened as a result, because I think it's quite plain that uh, you really don't understand John 3.16 fully unless you take it uh, in the light of what we are told in John 3.17. I had to point out about John 3.16 that it also starts with the word for and links us on to verses 14 and 15 and that you really can't understand 16 unless you've already grasped 14 and 15. And now I say the other end that you don't fully understand 16 unless you take in the truth of 17. 
How important it is that we should read the scripture as it is. But we are living in an age of slogans, aren't we? And we tend to do that with the Bible. We take a verse out and we put it up and we hold it out on its own. But you know, it's very wrong to take John 3.16 on its own. It can be very dangerous and misleading, as I want to try to show you. Here I say our Lord is continuing the same statement. He's elaborating it. This is partly explanatory of what he has said in the 16th verse. Now, our Lord obviously found it was essential that he should say this. And, of course, it became essential for this reason. Our Lord knew how prone mankind is to misunderstand God and to think of him in wrong terms. He knew that the Jews as a race were doing that at that very time. He knew that this man Nicodemus, one of the teachers and the masters of the Pharisees, that he was guilty of the same thing. You see, these people had got hold of the idea that when the Messiah came, they were looking forward to his coming, but they'd got the idea that when he came, he would come to judgment. He would come to judge especially the Gentiles, that the Romans who had conquered Palestine and the Jews would be judged and exterminated, and that all the other Gentile nations who had from time to time troubled God's people, they'd all be demolished. He would come and judge everybody else and exalt this nation supreme above the whole world. That was their idea. So they thought when uh, the Messiah comes, that is what he's going to do. And it was because of that, you see, when they found that the Messiah kept on telling them that he had come not to judge this first time, but to bring salvation, and especially by dying on a cross that they were offended, and they ridiculed it. It was a stumbling block, and they put him to death for that reason, and continued to persecute him and his church. Now, our Lord knew all that. So, you see, he's not content with putting it positively to Nicodemus. He has told him something like this. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, to judge and condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Very well. The world, I say, is always ready to misunderstand God. And it is still ready to do so. The average man has this idea of God, hasn't he? That God is someone who is entirely set against him. That's why men are always hoping that something or somebody will be able to prove that there isn't a God. That's an expression of the natural antagonism and enmity that is in the heart of man towards God. Man has got this conception of God that he's someone who delights in punishing, he delights in destroying. God as some kind of ogre, someone who's opposed to men and his best and his highest interests, someone who's there towering as some great tyrant ever above. That's the natural man's view of God. He hates God. And so his whole idea as to what God delights to do and what God wants to do is utterly wrong and absolutely false. And therefore our Lord goes out of his way, I say, not only to show that that is so tragically and terribly wrong, but that indeed the truth is the exact opposite. And that God must be looked at and considered as he has been pleased to reveal himself. There was no excuse for these Jews. God had manifested himself and his ways right through the Old Testament to them. That's the purpose of the Old Testament. 
There are some of the most moving and loving and glorious passages there. They knew all that. They prided themselves in these scriptures. They read them every Sunday in their synagogues. And yet in spite of them, they had this wrong notion. So our Lord, I say, emphasizes it by putting it like this. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now here is again one of these tremendous statements. He doesn't put it in the same terminology as the 16th verse, but I venture to say to you that this verse is as great and as wonderful as is the 16th verse. And as I say, it's a part of it. And we haven't really understood the 16th verse unless we understand the message of this. What does it teach us? Well, let me extract the principles. It's a very important verse, this. It holds us face to face with some of the basic propositions of the Christian faith. Here's the first. The world is already in a state of condemnation. Now, I don't want to spend too long with this this evening because it really is the main message of the next verse, which puts it like this. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I put it as a proposition. The world is already condemned. Our Lord puts it like this, that he has not come into the world to judge or to condemn the world. Why not? Well, because that wasn't necessary. Because the world is already condemned. It's already under condemnation. Now, the whole difficulty with men in sin, in a sense, this evening still is this. That he doesn't realize that. We always keep postponing all this to the future. As if condemnation is something that's not going to happen until the last day of judgment. But the world is already condemned. Now, the Bible is full of that statement. There is no need for God to send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's perfectly plain and clear in the Old Testament. Where is it found? Well, let me give you the evidence very hurriedly and briefly. How do I know that the world is under condemnation? I know that the world is under condemnation by the fact of death. Death alone, the fact that we all die, is a proof that the world is under condemnation. Man was not made to die. If man had not sinned, death would never have come into the world. Death is the punishment of sin. Death is always a part of the sentence of condemnation. Therefore, I argue that the fact of death in and of itself is proof positive that the world is under condemnation. Did you notice the way the Apostle Paul argued that in that fifth chapter of his epistle to the Romans that I read to you just now? This is his way of putting it. He says, until law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even upon them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. What's he mean? He means this. God's law was only given through Moses. But, says Paul, just stating a simple fact of history, though the law was not given until Moses came upon the scene, Men and women had been dying from the moment of Adam's fall right away without intermission until the giving of the law. Why? Well, that is the proof and the demonstration of the fact that the world is under condemnation. The law that says it hasn't yet come, but the fact has already been saying it. The fact that every human being born into this world from the time of Adam is subject unto death, is proof positive 
that the world is under condemnation. Death was never meant to be a part of the process. God is punishing sin by death, physical death, that in itself, without going any further, is sufficient proof that the whole world is under condemnation. Oh, you see what a terrible thing sin is. And how important it is that we should know our Bibles and what they teach. You see, this thing called death has come upon us all because of Adam's transgression. He was our representative, he was our head, and he sinned, and the condemnation of death came. God had told him, the moment thou eatest thereof, thou shalt die. And he did eat, and he did die. And death is upon us all, and we've all got to die. That is, we are under condemnation. Every one of us. But not only does physical death prove it. Our spiritual death proves it in exactly the same way. You see, man was made by God and he was made for God. And man uh, was given life and man with this life that God had given him was enjoying a life of communion with God. Is he still enjoying it? Are we all in this congregation enjoying it? If you are not enjoying a life of communion with God, it means one thing only. You are under condemnation. You notice how Paul again puts it at the beginning of that fifth chapter of Romans. There is therefore now, he says, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. There is until they're in Christ Jesus. Being, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. The fact that man doesn't know God and has no communion with God and no fellowship with God and can't find God, it means he's under condemnation. When he wasn't under condemnation, when Adam was perfect, he had the communion. But the moment he sinned, he came under condemnation, and then he lost the communion. And he couldn't find God in and of himself. God came to him, and mankind has been like that ever since. Very well, here's my second proof of condemnation. The fact that we cannot find God when we seek him. Now, we all know that, don't we? We've all tried that. We've all known what it is in a desperate moment to try to pray, and we feel we're just talking to ourselves. God isn't well. We're frantic, but we can't find him. We say with Job, oh, that I knew where I might find him. Why can't I find him? Well, because I'm under condemnation. It's a proof of it. There was no need for Christ to come into the world to condemn the world, because the world is already under condemnation. Well, I needn't keep you with this, as I say. This is something that is proved abundantly many times. In the law that God gave to the children of Israel through Moses, God has there told us very plainly and clearly that he expects certain things of us, and that if we don't do those things, we shall be punished. We shall be under condemnation. Now, it really is quite an irrelevance as to whether you think that's right or wrong. The fact is that God is the Lord God of the universe. And you might as well kick against a mountain as kick against God and his holy decrees. My dear friend, you and I are in no position to express judgments. We are under God. And you cannot escape him. And the holy God who made men in his own image, and gave him every opportunity that men could ever desire, has a right to say that if man has fallen from that, he shall be punished, and he has said so. God has given his commandments, his ten commandments, and his moral law, and he has made it perfectly plain that if we don't keep it, we shall be punished that we are under condemnation, and not one of us has ever kept it. Indeed, the whole purpose of the giving of the law was 
In order to make this plain and clear, listen again to the apostle saying that. He says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. The whole business of the giving of that law to Moses was not to provide men with a way whereby they could save themselves. They obviously couldn't. The business of the law was to show them that they couldn't, to show them where they were. It's in the law that God has defined these things. The fact of death is already demonstrating it. But now God wants to show it plainly and clearly. So he gives the law, moreover the law entered, that the offense might abound. You see, people say, oh, but I don't believe all this. I admit the fact of death, but it's got nothing to do with a man's relationship to God. Very well, says God. If you can't see it from the facts, I will now define it for you. I will put it for you on paper. I'll put it under points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then I'll work these out in detail. And there it is. I've pinpointed it. I've established it. I've shown you the offense. The condemnation. Nicodemus said our Lord to this man, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. The law has already done that. That's patent in the Old Testament. That is the message of the word of God. It's a picture of the failure and the condemnation of men. Very well. There is the first proposition. Let us now come to the second. The world is not only under condemnation. The world could not and the world cannot save itself. It's implicit in this statement. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The only implication there is that the world by itself cannot and could not save itself. But what's the meaning of this word saved? That the world through him might be saved. That's the thing, isn't it? What do you mean by salvation, says someone? What do you mean by being saved? Oh, what an important word this is. Well, let me give you its content. Being saved means just this. That we are put back into that relationship with God which men enjoyed at the beginning, and more. But that is what is being saved means. Let me divide it up and put it like this. To be saved means, first of all, that I am saved from the condemnation. Sentence has been pronounced upon me. You know, if we could only see these things as they are, we would see that life in this world, in a sense, is just like being in a prison. We are all condemned criminals, every one of us. We are all condemned sinners. Every man that's ever been born is a condemned sinner. We are by nature, says Paul to the Ephesians, the children of wrath, even as others. We are in the prison. We are under sentence. We are guilty. And the first thing, therefore, we need to be saved from is from the guilt of sin and the punishment that that guilt so richly deserves. Now I'm emphasizing that this is our first need. It isn't happiness you need, first of all. It isn't comfort. It isn't peace. It isn't a healed body. It isn't guidance. Oh, we need all these things. I know we do. But you know, before we need any one of them, we need to be right with God. We need to get out of that and from under that sentence of condemnation. I may not be here to live tomorrow. I may not need guidance for the future. I may not need physical health. I may die at any moment. Therefore, the one thing that matters first and foremost is this. My standing before God. And as I am by nature, I am under the condemnation of his holy law and his righteous indignation upon sin. I need to be delivered from the guilt of my sin. Can you deliver yourself from the guilt of your sin? Can you do anything at all about your past sins? 
You can't get rid of them. You can't erase them out of the record. You can't make atonement for them because as you're trying to make up for the past, you're sinning in the present, aren't you? And you're failing in the present. How can you possibly deal with it all? You cannot. It's impossible. Man cannot get rid of his past sin. He can't get rid of his original sinfulness in Adam. Neither can he get rid of his own personal guilt. That's only the first thing in being saved. The next thing we need is to be rid of the tyranny and the power and the dominion of sin over us. You see, when God made men, there was men standing erect and in correspondence with God. And he was subject to no one but to God. The moment he listened to the suggestion of the devil, he became subservient to the devil. He entered under what the Apostle Paul calls the dominion of sin and of Satan. He became what our Lord calls a captive of the strong man armed. You remember his picture. The strong man armed keepeth his goods at peace. We're all by nature nothing but the goods of the devil. We're his dupes, his victims, his serfs, and he commands us, and we're under his power, and he suggests things to us, and we all carry them out. You see, the whole world tonight is just proving what I'm saying to you. It is because men are in the grip of the devil and of sin that the world is as it is tonight. That's why there's all this horrible muddle in the world all the pain and the suffering and the agony and war and threats of war and jealousy and envy and unhappiness, it all comes from this devil's power upon us, controlling us, governing us, and leading us to such a life. And mankind isn't aware of this, but it's there, and so being saved means being taken out of that power, being set at liberty, out of the dominion of Satan, out of the kingdom of darkness. Can you do that for yourself? Has anybody ever succeeded in doing that for himself? There are some great men pictured in the Old Testament. Great saints. Great heroes of the faith. Look at them. And yet every single one of them was defeated by the devil. Not one of them could stand up to him. He defeated them all. No man can rid himself of the power of the devil, for the power of the devil is second only to the power of God himself. And you are not saved until you are free from the dominion and the tyranny of Satan. We need that. Isn't it almost impossible to stand up against the world and its way? How clever it is, how insinuating. Ah, says the world. If you want to get on, if you want to be happy, if you want this or that, well, you come this way, you do what we are saying and what we are doing. That's its subtle argument, and it's too much for us. We tend to go down, we say, I don't believe that's right, I believe the other's right. But there it is, these other considerations come in, and down we go. We are under the power of Satan. How difficult it is to stand. Isn't it a tremendously difficult thing to be honest in this world? To be truthful? to be moral and chaste and clean and pure. Oh, how difficult it is. Everything's against us. The power is so great, we all go down. To be saved means not only to be delivered from the guilt of sin, but also from its tyranny and its power. But you see, even then you're not saved. Something further is needed. What is that? Well, it's this. We need to have restored to us the righteousness that man has lost. God made man perfect. Adam was perfect. There was no sin in him. There was no blemish. There was no fault. He was righteous in the presence of God. And I am not saved until I'm brought back there. You see, it doesn't merely mean forgiveness. It doesn't merely mean getting rid of the power of particular sins. It means that I must be righteous in the presence of God. And this is something positive. You see, merely to forgive a man leaves him as he was and where he was. But that isn't enough to admit him into the presence of God. He must be righteous. Man was righteous. And he's not saved until that's restored to him. Can man do that? Of course he cannot. 
He's failed completely. No man is righteous or can weave for himself a robe of righteousness that is presentable in the presence of God. And then the next thing you see is this. To be admitted into the presence of God. Adam, before he fell, could find God whenever he desired. He had this right of access. He had this right of entry. And you know, you and I are not saved until we are brought back to that position. When we can go into the holiest of all. When in need and trouble, in time of need, we need grace to help us, we know we can find it and can always be sure that God will hearken and we can hearken to him. That's salvation. And then the certainty of being with God for all eternity. Man was meant for that. Not only to enjoy the presence of God here in this world for a while, but to enjoy it for all eternity without intermission and without end. And I am not saved until I am assured of all that. Is anybody still disputing my proposition that the world could not and cannot save itself? The apostle again has summed it up for us in one phrase. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's never been a man on earth who could say that he's found him and that he saved himself. Not one. Very well, I go on to my third proposition, which is this. And I ask you to listen to this with particular solemnity. It's in my verse. God's only way of saving us was in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now there's only one Implication there again. And it is this. I say it with the profoundest reverence. It is only in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. That God saves man. I venture to go further. I say that God even God could not save men apart from this. It is the only way. God could not save men merely by saying, I forgive you your sins. God cannot say that because he's a righteous and a holy God. God cannot say to man as he is in his sins, all right, I'll forget it and receive you into my presence. For light and darkness cannot be mixed. Holiness and sin cannot blend. Purity and impurity cannot go together. It's impossible. The inherent nature of God makes the thing unthinkable. And as I've often pointed out, for a sinful man as he is to be in the presence of God is hell. The Bible tells us that, that there are people at the end who will look at Christ and see him and they'll be so terrified that they'll say to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. So you see, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't come into this world merely to tell us that God is love and that God is ready to forgive us. The Son of God didn't come into this world merely to announce that God is ready to pardon and to save us. The Son of God came into this world to make the way of salvation and of pardon and of reconciliation. And if he had not come, there would be no reconciliation. There would be no salvation. There could be none. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, that's the operative word, by means of him might be saved. Or again, if I may quote the Apostle Paul putting it in his way, 
God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God was through Christ in all that he did by sending Christ reconciling the world unto himself. It's the only way. You know, if we all but realized this, it would transform the whole of our outlook. The trouble with mankind is that it doesn't realize that it's under condemnation. It's not alive to this. If there's a possibility of a war coming next week, everybody be very concerned. What can we do? What preparations can we make? We make preparations for illness and a thousand and one things. But here, my friend, I'm talking about your eternal and everlasting destiny. You are in this world. You're going to die. You're going out of it. You're facing judgment. And you'll go on through all eternity. Are you concerned? Are you alive to the fact? Do you know that you're already condemned? And do you realize that it's such an appalling thing to be under God's condemnation and such a tremendous thing that this is the only way whereby it can be dealt with? Sin is as terrible a thing as this that even the almighty God cannot deal with it except by sending his only son into this world to live and die and rise again. There are hundreds and thousands of people in this world who think that they worship God and that they pray to him and they don't mention the name of Christ. They don't see that he's necessary. They think they can go to God as they are. It's just this appalling ignorance. There is no way to God except through his only begotten Son whom he sent into this world. And I would solemnly point out to you that if you are not utterly and absolutely dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done, you don't know God. You're in a fool's paradise. You're still under condemnation and you'll realize it when it's too late, unless you believe this message. Very well, how does God save through Christ? God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Here you see the love of God. God so loved the world that he sent his only son into the world, that through him they might be saved. How? Well, isn't it obvious? Look at it like this. It is man who has sinned against God. It is man who has become lost. Therefore, obviously, no one can save men except a man. An angel can't save mankind. If an angel could have done it, God would have sent an angel. He has his angels and his archangels. He uses Gabriel and Michael to take messages. Why didn't he send them to save? They couldn't. They were angels. It's man that needs to be saved. It's man who's gone wrong. And it's man who must somehow be raised up. How can it happen? I say it must be by a man. The apostle argues again in that fifth of Romans, since by man came sin, even so by man must obedience and righteousness come. Hence, you see, the absolute necessity of the incarnation. God sent his son into the world. That's a way of describing the incarnation. God sent his only son who was with him from eternity in his bosom. He sent him out of heaven into this world. That's the gospel. And he did it deliberately in order to save men. Before men can be saved, there must be a man who is competent and able to save. So God sent his own son and he was born as a man. The word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. He's man. Adam was the first man, here's the second man. Truly man. Perfect man. 
But you see, men alone isn't enough. Adam was a perfect man, but he fell. Perfect man is not enough to withstand Satan. He'd go down again. We need someone who is not only man, but something more. To stand and to conquer. He's God and men. He's already been saying that, you remember, to Nicodemus. What a wonderful passage this is. No man, he saith, hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. I'm on earth, he says, but I'm still in heaven. I'm speaking to you as a man. I'm still God. God, men. Don't try to understand it. I don't understand it. But this is the message of the New Testament. This is Christianity, that God's own and only begotten Son has entered into the world, has taken on him human nature. He's truly man. He's standing as man's representative. Adam was the first representative. He went down. Here is a new representative, a new head of a new humanity. And before he can save us, he must be able to keep God's law. He must be able to render a perfect satisfaction to God's every demand. Not only that, as we've seen, before he can save us, he must be big enough and strong enough to be able to bear our sins and the punishment that they deserve. No man could do that, and yet he must be a man. And yet no man, I say, could do it however perfect. The weight of sin would kill him and destroy him. No, no, before this man can save, he needs the eternal life of God as well. And in Christ you've got both. Eternal God, man. And so he was big enough and great enough and strong enough to take our sins upon him. And God dealt with him and smote him them and punished them in him and he died but he rose again in the power of an endless life declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead this you see is what is necessary our guilt must be dealt with the devil must be dealt with we must be given a positive righteousness. We must have someone who can present us to God in an acceptable manner. We've seen that we need all that before we are saved. And this is what our Lord is telling Nicodemus here. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He has done it. He's taken the sin and borne the guilt and the punishment. He has conquered the devil. He's routed the enemy. To all who believe in him, he gives a new nature, a new life, a new start, more. He unites us to himself. We become parts of his body, members of his flesh and of his blood, as the apostle puts it in writing to the Ephesians. He puts his Holy Spirit into us who goes on working in us both the will and to do of his good pleasure, delivering us from sin progressively, and you know at the end he'll finally deliver us. He will cleanse us so that we shall be faultless and blameless without spot nor wrinkle nor any such thing. Yes, as Jude in his great and glorious benediction, now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He alone can save. He deals with every aspect of salvation, with our every need. He has taken the guilt and the punishment. He clothes us with his own righteousness and holiness and truth. He gives us his own nature, born again. And he will lead us and take us and go on working in us by the Spirit until we shall be finally glorified and be like him himself. That's salvation. 
And he alone could do it. He alone could give it us. My friend, that's the way to measure the love of God. He didn't send his son that first time to condemn us. God knows we were already condemned. The Old Testament shows me that. But that the world in its condemnation through him might be saved. Have you seen your need? Have you seen your condemnation? Have you stopped trying to justify yourself and to argue against God and his holy law and saying if this and but that, are you lying prostrate and helpless and hopeless and saying, yes, it's true. I've defied him. I've gone against him. I've put my own will instead of his. I've asserted my own views. I've disagreed with and contradicted his word. Admit it all. And say I deserve nothing but punishment. I deserve nothing but hell. But thank God. I can see that God has so loved me. That he sent his only son into this world. To save me. And I believe that when he died. He was dying for me and for my sins. He has given me new life. I am clothed with his righteousness. In him I have access unto the Father by the Holy Spirit. And I know that God is my Father. And I know that he who has begun a good work in me will perform it. Until the day of Jesus Christ. My dear friend. Have you seen the need? More important, have you seen the free salvation which is offered you as a gift through Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Believe on him now, and the moment you do so, you are saved. You have eternal life. And there is no more condemnation as far as you are concerned. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.